Hey, Jen, uh, I can introduce uh, Dr. Candelario Cosme if uh, if that'd be OK. I got freed up from what I was doing, so. Yeah, sure, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, uh, we have we have some people on. We've got a good cohort so far, so you can go ahead. OK, very good. I'll, I'll introduce. Uh, so it's a, a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Candelario, Candelario Cosme. Uh, Dr. Candelario Cosme is a uh, undergraduate or is a college graduate of the University of Puerto Rico uh, and then attended the Universidad Central de Caribe in Bayamón, Puerto Rico. Uh, so uh, she is very proud of her Hispanic culture and joined us at um, USF uh, in uh, as she went along her training. She joined us at USF for her endocrinology fellowship <clears throat> where she was trained by the great Joaquin Gomez Daspet as program director. Uh, we were thrilled to have Dr. Candelario Cosme join us at Tampa General uh, five years ago. Hard to believe it's been almost half a decade. Uh, she provides outstanding care uh, to our um, patients at Tampa General Hospital. She is a very, very proud member now of the Tampa Bay community, and we are really, really blessed to have her on in our USF Department of Internal Medicine faculty. Uh, today, she's going to be presenting the cardiovascular impact of cross cross sex hormone therapy on transgender patients. Uh, this is a very very interesting topic. It's a very very relevant topic. So, and we are very excited to listen. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, Dr. Candelario Cosme, take it take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Lesama, for that introduction. <laughs> Um, so yes, uh, I'm very uh, pleased and happy to be uh, presenting to you guys this lecture topic. Um, as some of you may know, transgender care medicine is one of my passions within endocrinology practice. So I'll go ahead and start. Um, I'll start with objectives. Um, I, I would like to start uh, with the next slide defining or introducing the definition of gender dysphoria. I think that's very important for all of you or the audience to know before I go along throughout the presentation. I'll also discuss briefly some of the terminology of transgender care medicine that I'll be um, mentioning along some of my slides so that everybody is aware of uh, what I'm referring to. I'll also discuss about epidemiology of gender identity disorder. Then I'll go to what's the criteria, which is very important. I know that, you know, not um, there are people outside endocrinology that uh, practice transgender care, mostly primary care physicians that I'm pretty sure are part of the audience. So um, that's important for everyone to know. Then discuss the goals of CHD or cross-sex hormone therapy. And then I'll go along. What are the effects of cardiovascular health that we know so far and what should be done in the future? So as an introduction, as I mentioned, I would like to start off with what's the definition of gender dysphoria? This is the distress that a patient can experience when their gender identity is incongruent with their birth assigned gender. To manage gender dysphoria, CHD or cross-sex hormone therapy, and I'll refer to it in the presentation as CHD, um, is recommended to suppress the natal secondary sexual characteristics and therefore induce their desired gender through physical changes. Hormone therapy in cisgenders has been studied multiple times along the years. However, um, those studies cannot be formally applied to our transgender population. So, this table summarizes very well some of the terms that I'll, that we use in transgender care medicine. And this is, again, just for the audience to um, uh, be known to these terms that I'll go, uh, I'll mention along the presentation. So first off with cisgender, this is people whose gender identity aligns with their biological or natal sex. Um, gender dysphoria already mentioned, Transgender is actually an umbrella term for people whose gender identity differs from their natal or biological sex. A transgender male is a person whose sex was assigned female, but identifies as a male. And a transgender female is a person whose sex was assigned male, but identifies as a female. 
In terms of the epidemiology, about 0.3 to 0.6 percent of the adult population in the U.S. is transgender. The prevalence depends upon the definition used to classify a person as a transgender. So either we can go by diagnostic codes to get that prevalence, that would be including gender dysphoria, hormone therapy, gender affirming surgery, and that rounds about seven to nine per 100,000 people. However, self-report of being transgender, it's a higher number of 871 per 100,000 people. The highest percentage of transgender patients in the U.S. is considering the following states, Hawaii, California, Georgia, New Mexico, Texas, and Florida. When I saw this, um, I was a little bit uh, taken away that New York state was not part of that list. I uh, did part of my training in New York, and I know there's a huge LGBT community. Uh, so I was surprised it was not considered among the highest percentage uh, states. Uh, New York also has very good, well-rounded transgender clinics as such as Mount Sinai and NYU that I'm familiar with. Um, and some of my patients go there to get sex reassignment surgery. So I was surprised New York wasn't there. Um, also, approximately, approximately about 25 million transgender individuals uh, uh, are worldwide. So very important for the audience to know what is the criteria for starting CHD. I see this frequently where we have patients that establish care with us, but unfortunately they have not undergone the proper steps before we start them on CHD. Um, and one of the most important things is for these three points to be well documented, um, either in a clearance letter or office notes, especially from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, this is important. So we have to make sure that there's persistent, well documented gender dysphoria or gender incongruence as per DSM 5 criteria. We also have to make sure that there's documentation, that there's capacity from the patient to make a well informed decision. And then there's relevant medical or mental health issues that are well controlled. Um, this is important because, you know, especially. In the pediatric population, um, which I, I attend to 18 years uh, or above, but I know for sure that uh, our colleagues in the pediatric endocrinology program, um, they go by the transgender care guidelines and those state that ideally a transgender or I should say a patient that wants to transition and start CHD ideally should do it after puberty. The reason is because throughout puberty, it is physiologically uh, normal, if that makes sense, for someone going through puberty to have some signs or symptoms that could be associated uh, to gender dysphoria and then may go away after completion of puberty. So it's very important for that. Um, in the adult population, uh, the things that we want to make sure that are well controlled is any history of depression, anxiety, or any psychiatry illness before we start CHD. Otherwise, those disorders may be worsened or exacerbated. So what are the goals of CHD? Uh, main goal is to induce physical changes to match their gender identity. Uh, and the treatment goal is to maintain hormone levels in the normal physiological range for the target gender. So just as an example, uh, if I have a tran uh, trans female or a transgender female that was born a male, wants to transition to a female, I want to raise the, her estrogen levels to one of a cis female, someone that was form, uh, born a female, and I want to suppress the, her testosterone levels to one that is um, adequate for a cis female. For transgender men, we want to stop menses, we want to induce fertilization. There's going to be a change in voice and there's going to be obviously male physical contours that will um, have an onset a couple of months after initiating therapy. For transgender women, we want to induce physical femi feminization through uh, growth of breast buds, decrease of facial and body hair and changing voice. Um, Sometimes with CHD, change in voice may not be achieved completely, and there are speech therapies that may help our transgender patients 
um, to change their tone of voice to one of their desired gender identity. So the next two slides, including this one, I wanted to include because uh, this is something that my patients asked me on the initial visit when uh, we're going to start them on CHD. And uh, for male to female uh, patients, they, you know, the most common question is when am I going to start having some feminizing effects from the CHD? Um, I would say that on this table, the one that they're um, most eager about is breast growth, right? So the onset is about three to six months and the maximum is about two to three years. Um, it's very important. Uh, this is very important because for top surgery, as we call it uh, in transgender care medicine or in formal medical terms will be uh, breast augmentation or mammoplasty for trans female patients. Ideally, you want to wait at least a year. That's what the the transgender care guidelines suggest. This is because we the the surgeon would like the at least some breast growth uh, before proceeding with surgery. And if they can extend it up to two years, that's even better. In terms of our uh, trans male patients or transgender male patients, um, I would say that the most common asked questions um, when they're about to start CHD is that they want to know when there's going to be cessation of menses. That will likely occur one to six months after starting them on CHD. And in terms of uh, facial or body hair growth, uh, the onset is about six to 12 months, and the maximum may go up to four to five years. So what are the CHD regimens that we have um, established or, or we are known about for our transgender population? I'll start with the transgender uh, women regimens. Um, I apologize beforehand if this table is a little bit blurry, but it is in the WPATH standards of care, and it's also available in up today if you want to look back at it. But um, we have estrogen, we have antiandrogens, and we have GnRH agonists. Um, GnRH agonists is something that I do not have an experience with because in the adult population, we usually don't have to use it. This is typically used in the pediatric population to suppress um, if the patient wants to start um, CHD prior to puberty. This is to suppress mostly uh, uh, puberty um, and help with the transition. So the ones that we typically um, prescribe for our adult transgender population is estrogen and antiandrogens. Estrogen comes in oral, transdermal, and uh, parenteral form. Um, transdermal being the one with a lower uh, or less risk of uh, cardiovascular effects or any uh, or the rest of its side effects, and parenteral route being the one that has the higher risk of side effects. Um, oral is in between. Uh, typically, we start with oral because it tends to be less costly, and transdermal is the one that uh, tends to be more costly. Um, and these are the dosages and the regimens that we do for each formulation for estrogen. In terms of antiandrogens, we typically use spironolactone. Um, we have to be careful, as many of you know, spironolactone may cause hypotension. Um, it is a potassium sparing diuretic, so it may cause hyperkalemia. Um, so spironolactone, uh, typically I start at the lowest dose and then I titrate up based on how they're able to tolerate it. Sometimes 100 milligrams may be too much for them. Um, so I may start at a lower dose, such as 50 milligrams per day, and then go up from there, depending on, on how, on, on tolerance. Uh, spironolactone of note is not required once um, the patient undergoes orchiectomy. That is something that on the initial visit, when I'm starting CHD, if the patient has their testes intact. I I discuss with them, you know, to consider it. Uh, one, because they may not require spironolactone in the future, and two, um, it may also help to not raise as much the estrogen um, dosage in the future once the uh, testes are removed. 
For the transgender men, the regimen is, is pretty straightforward and simple, more simple than for uh, transgender female. We have testosterone and it may come in parenteral uh, formulation and then also transdermal, which includes gel and patch. Uh, the gel and the patch are the most costly ones versus the parenteral formulation. Um, for the uh, transdermal, uh, and patch also in terms of the risk is uh, less of the side effects uh, versus the parenteral route. Um, and the gel, ideally, this is just for anyone that has um, uh, is taking care of any transgender patients. The gel has not been and the patch has, has not been um, uh, studied as much as the parenteral formulation in our uh, transgender male population. So this is a table that um, is included in our transgender care guidelines uh, in the endocrine society. And here is well established what medical risks have been associated with sex hormone therapy. For transgender female, <clears throat> the main therapy is going to be estrogen aside from adjunct therapy, and I'll go more into detail in the next slides. But um, estrogen, the very high risk of adverse outcomes, thromboembolic disease is a big one, and moderate risk. We have macroprolactinomas. Yes, uh, there are some patients um, that may have an underlying uh, prolactinoma or an unknown prolactinoma. So it's very important for transgender patients to have a baseline prolactin before you initiate CHT, because once you start them on estrogen, they uh, their um, prolactinoma uh, tumor growth may be exacerbated by estrogen. So that's very important. I always check up prolactin prior to starting CHT. Um, also, there's still risk of breast cancer, even though these are transgender female that were born male. As we know, the male population still has a, a low risk uh, of developing breast cancer. Um, there's also CAD, um, CBA, and then hypertriglyceridemia. Very common. I see hypertriglyceridemia in most of my trans female patients. Um, another thing that I discussed with them prior to starting CHD is that Depending on how the lipid uh, panel looks in the future, I may need to start them on a statin therapy just so that way I don't have to cut as much on the estrogen therapy and still induce uh, feminization. Uh, for the transgender males, uh, we have testosterone. The very high risk of this is erythrocytosis, and uh, which is defined as hematocrit over 50%. Moderate risk of appears outcomes. Um, transaminitis may occur, which is defined as three times the upper limit of normal. Uh, still risk of CAD, CBA, hypertension, and breast or uterine cancer. So, so far in our cisgender population, we know that the cardiovascular effect of estrogen and testosterone is these that are listed here, hypertension, thromboembolic disease, um, myocardial infarction, stroke, and of course, lipid profile changes. Um, this was a figure from uh, this article written by Connolly and et al. Uh, this is a cardiology um, journal called hypertension. And although, you know, we've, or at least in my clinical experience, I've heard bad things about estrogen and testosterone replacement. There are actually some benefits of estrogen or estradiol and testosterone in our vascular health. You know, some of them may be the ones listed here, vascular tone and blood pressure control, protection against vascular inflammation, atherogenesis and injury. Uh, there's even ischemic uh, cardio protection via upper regulation of some cardiac receptors. So there are some benefits. Not everything is bad. So I summarized in the slides or what I will discuss a little bit more in detail in the next slides. But what you know, what do we know so far in terms of um, previous review studies slash studies of transgender vascular health uh, with CHD. And I tried to, to briefly 
summarize them between you know the risk uh, that you'll see in this columns. So ischemic heart disease risk, um, the first observational study in transgenders was published in the 80s. Uh, this did not demonstrate any difference on incidence of MI or mortality. There were mixed results of me, uh, male to female and female to male being at increased risk of MI versus other studies demonstrating that in the end, there was really no significant increase in either group. In terms of thromboembolic disease, there are early observational studies that demonstrated a 20 to 45 fold increase in the rates of thromboembolic disease in male to female individuals. And although most uh, studies demonstrate an increased risk in male to female, findings have unfortunately not been uniformed. And for cardiometabolic risk, uh, testosterone CHD has been associated with change, significant changes in lipid profile, increased in triglycerides, high LDL, low HDL. However, no increased risk of MI has been noticed in female to male. In estrogen CHD, lipid profile change usually predominates mostly in triglycerides that um, may uh, rise after initiation of therapy. And there has been mixed results of increase in insulin resistance in either transgender group. These are some of, their st of the studies uh, or articles, I should say, that have discussed transgender vascular health uh, in the past few years. And some of them, I'll dissect them a little bit more in the next slides. Starting with this um, article that uh, was demonstrating a systematic review. Uh, of sex steroids and cardiovascular outcomes in our transgender individuals. So this was an evaluation of the following sex steroids effects in changes in lipid profile, cardiovascular events, thromboembolic disease, mortality in transgenders. Across the selected studies, 4,731 transgenders were included. 3,231 male to female participants had a mean age of about 19.3 to 43.7 years. 1,500 female to male participants had a mean age that was pretty similar to the male to females, and they were relatively young. Exposure and follow-up ranged from three months to 41 years, and the review period was between 1980 through April 2015. In terms of the results and data um, that they were able to collect, in the female to male group on testosterone CHG, there was a significant increase in LDL and triglyceride levels and a decrease in HDL at three to six months of therapy and 24 months or more compared with baseline. Of note, what's interesting is that in postmenopausal cis females, these are non transgender females, um, testosterone, which is controversial in terms of treatment of postmenopause uh, post has been associated with a decrease in TG level. I wonder if it's because, you know, in a, with cis females going through postmenopause, the testosterone dosage is way lower than the testosterone dosage that uh, we're giving our female to male because we're trying, again, like I mentioned in earlier slides, we're trying to bring those testosterone levels in a trans male patient to the one of someone that was born uh, uh, biologically as a male. Um, so I wonder if it's because of that. In male to female on estrogen CHD, the only significant change was in triglyceride level at around 24 months or more. Most of those patients were on oral estrogens and their uh, triglyceride level was not affected as much by transdermal estrogen. As I had mentioned, transdermal ten tends to uh, not cause as much of uh, side effects. In the male to female group, 56 thromboembolic events occurred in 1,767 patients. In the female to male group, thromboembolic disease was reported in only one out of 771 individuals. Stroke was reported in eight out of 859 male to female individuals and was not reported in any of the female to male individuals. Myocardial infarction was reported in 14 out of 1,073 male to female transgenders and less in female to male. 
Mortality was reported in 139 of 1,486 male to female individuals and in 13 out of 651 female to male participants. Causes of death not only included cardiovascular events, but unfortunately also included suicides, where the higher rate was mostly seen in male to female rather than female to male. So in conclusion or summary of this uh, systematic review, although male to female transgender on estrogen CHT appeared to have less of a change in lipid profile, that group was actually more affected by events of thromboembolic disease, MI, stroke, versus the female to male on testosterone. These results were based on data from one center where many male to female participants received high doses of oral estrogens. Um, unfortunately, the quality of evidence in the study was low because of the following. These were uncontrolled and observational studies. Number two, small number of events leading to imprecision of estimates. Number three, short and varied duration of follow-up. Number four, heterog heterogeneity of treatment regimens and inconsistency of results across studies. And lastly, there is lack of data of patient outcomes in the pediatric or adolescent population. Uh, going back to the um, article of Connolly and et al., um, they have this uh, table which summarized the effects of GHD. They put in here GHD, which is uh, the same as uh, CHD or gender affirming hormone therapy and the vascular health of our transgender patients. And the take point from this table is that they also mentioned that estrogen use in male to female patients confers an increased risk of MI and stroke. Of note, for those wondering, the column that says strength of evidence, the NR stands for non-randomized. So what do our guidelines currently say? in endocrine society. So there's a statement that um, states the following, CHD in transgenders confers many of the same risks associated hormone replacement therapy in cisgender patients. The risks arise from and are worsened by inadvertent or intentional use of superphysiologic doses of sex hormones, as well as use of inadequate doses of sex hormones to maintain normal physiology. So what about um, adjunct treatments, treatment options to minimize CVD? We know that there is some cardiovascular impact, um, and although it's not well defined, what else can we do for now until we have more of that data? Um, so in male to female, as I had mentioned in the first slides, spironolactone can be used to suppress testosterone. It can also help with lowering of high blood pressure uh, that estrogen CHD may cause. Reproductive organ surgeries or captamine male to female, that's going to help to not raise as much estrogen dosage in the future for trans female patients. And hysterectomy in female to male, it also helps the same with testosterone. Um, and what about progesterone use in male to female? So um, not every uh, endocrinologist or trans care uh, uh, provider, um, transgender care provider, uh, will use progesterone in male to female patients. I This is something that was not around my site when I was in training and um, for those wondering, our endocrinology fellowship program in the VA, we have a huge transgender population, I should say, or significant amount of transgender patients that we follow during training. And at the time, progesterone was nowhere in sight to be used in male to female. Um, after I graduated, I came across this perspective article um, from Dr. Pryor, who specializes in women's health and transgender care in Canada. And her clinical experience of use of progesterone as an adjunct in estrogen CHD is based on evidence-based medicine studies in cis females and cis, male, cis males, in other words, patients that are not transgender. So progesterone also of note has been studied in men for those wondering why progesterone use in men. And the reason is because it has been studied for treatment of substance abuse 
and also male patients that have undergone traumatic brain injury. So Dr. Pryor believes that both estradiol and progesterone are theoretically important in transfemale CHD. So based out of this, I also use progesterone uh, in my male to female patients. So she discusses in her article that based on previous evidence-based medicine, progesterone use in men has shown the following. One, anti-androgen effects by suppressing elation gonadal testosterone. Number two, inhibition of conversion of testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. Number three, bone formation simulating effects, thus increasing bone mineral density. Um, number four, improvement of sleep. I always tell my patients to best take it at bedtime for anyone in the audience that has gone through a first trimester of pregnancy. Um, when we feel super tired in that uh, trimester of pregnancy and we sleep for way more hours than we normally do while not pregnant, it's because of the high levels of progesterone. So um, obviously in terms of physiology, physiology of pregnancy versus uh, giving progesterone to a male to female, the levels are different, but they do feel some drowsiness and sleepiness throughout the day. So I always recommend that they take it at bedtime and they are able to tolerate it very well that way. And then there's also an increase um, in breast maturation. So what about progesterone and cardiovascular impact? So in the past, unfortunately, progesterone has had a negative reputation of increase in CBD, but this is because the effect is seen mostly in uh, androgenic progestins. There's actually several generations of progestins and one, uh, ones may be less androgenic than others. The third generation like norethendrone, norgestrel, those tend to be less androgenic. Um, however, other uh, studies have shown that progesterone may improve cardiovascular physiology. So there is uh, statements in the medical liter literature that say that Progesterone increases flow-mediated dilatation, and through this action, it may decrease risk of uh, VTE and assist on the prevention of CBD. There also may be less of a negative impact on CBD or cardiovascular disease due to available formulations so, such as nowadays, such as oral micronized progesterone. And of note, unfortunately, there are no studies available of progesterone use in trans women and the risk of heart disease, BTE, stroke, etc. So in this slide and the next one, um, I want to emphasize what should we be doing as transgender care providers um, to our transgender patients that are already on CHD. And if there's something that I want you to take out of this presentation is this slide and the next one, because this is very important. And I don't think that every transgender care doctor or any doctor that's taking care for transgender patients on CHD is very well aware of this risk monitoring. I highlighted here, this is for the transgender male patients. Uh, I highlighted here the ones that I consider the ones that are most important. Number one being to evaluate the patient every three months in the first year. And then after the first year, once or twice uh, per year to monitor for appropriate signs of paralyzation and for developing development of adverse reactions. So um, the measurement of testosterone should be done every three months until levels are in the normal physiologic male range. So that should be around, it says here, 400 to 700. Um, I usually go by 400 to 800. Something uh, important uh, for you to know, the, the level checks depend on the regimen that you have your patient on. So for instance, if you have someone that is on the parenteral formulation or injections, regardless of whether it's sub-Q or IM, if you have them every two weeks, the level should be checked mid-cycle. Mid-cycle meaning five to seven days in between injections. That's the best way to go to adjust the dose. If you have someone on a weekly regimen, the, the level of testosterone should be checked the day before the next injection. So you want to check a trough level in that type of regimen. And if you have someone on the gel, um, 
the patient should be checking the testosterone level about two hours after applying gel, and it doesn't matter what day uh, of the week. Uh, but very important two hours after gel application. Um, the other thing that's very important to monitor is hematocrit or hemoglobin at baseline every three months, and then after that less frequently. Uh, we also want to monitor weight, blood pressure, and lipids at regular intervals. If I see someone that has prior to initiating a CHD, I always check all of the labs just to make sure everything is good to go before I give any prescription for testosterone or estrogen. And if I see that they have elevated hematocrit or hemoglobin, I may send them for a uh, hematology evaluation to make sure everything is good from there and or if there's anything else that should be done. Um, other thing is a transgender male that has an intact uterus should have an annual pap smear according to ACOG or the GYN guidelines. So that's very important as well. For transgender females, the same applies in terms of monitoring for uh, baseline labs and then after that testosterone and estradiol. We want a uh, transgender female to have a testosterone level of less than 50, so around someone that is uh, um, biologically a female and not a transgender. Um, the serum estradiol should not exceed one of the peak physiologic range, so it should not be higher than 200. This is, uh, there are some transgender females that they think that the higher the number, the more feminization they're going to get, and unfortunately, more side effects they're going to get. So this is something that we always, or at least from my end, and also part of my training, we always emphasize to our trans female patients, we have to do this in a safe manner. Um, and so I typically aim for 150 to 200 if the if there's no pertinent medical history. If I have an elderly patient, and yes, we have elderly transgender patients that um, start CHT at an advanced age, um, then I aim for a lower uh, physiologic range of estradiol, and I aim between 50 to 100. Um, also, if there's history of stroke, history of heart disease, I also aim for lower, regardless of the age. For individuals on spironolactone, you want to monitor for hyperkalemia, so that should also be uh, followed up closely, and then routine cancer screening as recommended. So what does that mean? For example, mammogram. So I will send my transgender females about a year after starting uh, CHD to have a mammogram uh, screening done. And then after that, as per the guidelines uh, for breast cancer screening. And then, of course, lastly here to consider a bone mineral density testing at baseline. So what are the key points um, that I want you to, to leave or take from this presentation, I should say? Um, studies so far have provided mixed results of risk of CHD in transgender patients. Overall, it appears that there's not that much of an increased risk of cardiovascular events in female to male individuals on testosterone um, and male to female on estrogen appear to be more affected than the uh, other transgender group. Although estrogen appears to have a positive effect on decreasing LDL, increasing HDL, there's still uh, a negative effect on the triglycerides, and this may be contributing to a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease in this uh, group. Further research is definitely needed, especially prospective studies with matched control groups, uh, research on use of progesterone on male to female individuals, and also long-term effects of pubertal suppression and subsequent introduction of CHD in our adolescent patients. And how about future guidelines considerations? I mean, should we include our transgender patients on CHD on the ASCVD risk guidelines for scanning therapy? And lastly, very important, despite the risk side effects of CHT, regular monitoring of these will always play the most important role. And with that, I end my presentation. These are my references, and thank you so much for having me today.
Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Let's see if there's any questions, whether it be from endocrinologists or non endocrinologists. Endocrinologists always ask the hardest questions, so let's see if we have any endocrine askers out there. Thank you, Dr. Candelario. This is Alex Ramirez, endocrinology at the Tampa VA. Thank you so much for a really uh, quite broad and encompassing presentation, you know, where you presented a ton of the evidence and thank you for kind of uh, summarizing and putting it in great context uh, for, for use. Uh, I agree with you in almost everything. I do have um, a common question, uh, which is on the, on the use of of progestins, you know, progesterone. Um, I think, you know, you presented the reference from Dr. Pryor. Uh, she has been a strong advocate. She's a, you know, a very well recognized researcher in the topic. She's been advocating for progesterone use in both cis women as well as trans women. Uh, but she's also uh, perhaps been involved in a lot of controversy as a lot of the argument seems to have somewhat of a soft scientific background. And, and therefore there's still kind of a somewhat of a strong uh, group opposition in the endocrine uh, as well as transgender perhaps community. We are awaiting for the standards of care eight from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, hopefully to come out sometime this year. But I want to, to hear you kind of uh, deepen more in that potential controversy and thank you. Yes, I mean, from my end, I, I, and I'm very well aware of the controversy, um, at least from my end, I have actually have good um, feedback from my patients. And then also I have not seen any um, uh, deleterious effects uh, while I start them on progesterone. As per the experience of Dr. Pryor, she usually starts them on 300 milligrams per day. I start at a lower dose of 100 milligrams per day, and then I go up depending um, uh, by chemical tests, uh, how they look, and then also how the patient uh, is feeling. I would say this is the feedback from my patients. Uh, the, the things that I've heard from my trans female patients is less irritability, more like their mood swings, uh, perhaps, you know, part of the gender dysphoria as well are much more control once I start them on progesterone. They've also noticed that they're um, uh, less, it definitely helps with the body hair growth that they have and it's minimized and their their skin, they have positive skin changes is softer, uh, smoother. So um, I can only tell you about my clinical experience throughout the that I get from my patients and I'm very well aware of the controversy that she you know, surrounds her. So yes, I'm eager to see what WPATH standards of care eight has to say about progesterone use. Yeah, thank you so much. Excellent, as you see, the endocrinologists do ask very hard questions, Dr. Ramirez, they're not disappoint. I know where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Ramirez for that question. Any, any other endocrine or non-endocrinologists, any other questions? All right, seems like everybody, you satisfied everybody here. So again, I think Dr. Candelario Cosme really epitomizes the excellence of the USF uh, Division of Endocrinology. And so we are blessed to have such great faculty members uh, with us uh, throughout the organization. And uh, really want to recognize uh, Dr. Gomez Daspet, our program director who trained uh, most of them. Uh, so, um, so thank you. Joaquin for the great job you do there, and to Dr. Krischer, uh, who also is a vice chair of basic uh, research, um, and um, Jeff, of course, well known as uh, one of the top, if not the top NIH uh, uh, funded uh, in endocrinology or in, in anything. Uh, so we are very blessed to have Dr. Krischer in our Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Candelario Cosmo, Co Cosme. Uh, Bayamón, Puerto Rico is quite proud today uh, so very good. I hope everybody has a great day. We'll catch you next week for Thursday Grand Rounds. Take care. Thank you.